Throughout the first two and a half decades of the Succession Wars, the periphery realms looked on in mute horror as the great houses of the Inner Sphere obliterated one another with weapons of mass destruction. No doubt some among the former territorial states considered this just deserts for those who had spent centuries exploiting them, but the cataclysm unleashed on the Inner Sphere so far surpassed the misery of the reunification and freedom wars that most felt deeply uncomfortable celebrating the news. It's important to realise that the periphery only had a fragmentary understanding of what was transpiring in the Inner Sphere. Comstar was making little to no effort to maintain their HPG network that far from Terra, nor replace those damaged in the uprising. From the perspective of the average citizen, they would have first heard of the growing tensions between the member states, and likely the pronouncements of the successor lords that they intended to rule the Star League. From that point on, the Concordat, Magistracy and Outworlds would surely have transitioned to a war footing if they weren't already. Invasion seemed imminent. Reports of an outbreak of hostilities along all borders would have had them preparing for the worst, and rumours of planetary extinctions, if they could be believed, would no doubt have heightened the feeling of growing terror. But over the next few years, the merchant jump ships they relied upon both for essential supplies and for accounts of the war steadily reduced in number. As the successor states commandeered ever more civilian vessels, and likely any foreign ones that entered their territory, less and less information was able to filter out to the periphery states. It would have been as if a supermassive black hole had appeared at the heart of the old Star League, and gradually expanded to engulf the Inner Sphere, swallowing everything in its reach. The news blackout likely created a feeling of deep uncertainty and paranoia. Perhaps some even wondered if they were all that was left. The complete breakdown of interstellar travel had immediate and disastrous outcomes for the distant periphery. While they had craved freedom from the Star League, they still expected Inner Sphere traders to do business with them. Many colonies were entirely dependent on food shipments to survive, but with civilian transports regularly pressed into service with the Navy, what few independent merchants still existed had their hands full trying to keep their own nations hungry fed. None could risk travelling through open war zones to reach the periphery. This problem was exacerbated by a lack of diversification on many of the periphery worlds. As former territories of the League, the planetary economies were often hyper-focused on just one or two industries, or sometimes even a single product. When those closely interdependent worlds could no longer export their product or trade with their partners, economic collapse followed hastening the rapid decline of many systems. Each passing year only worsened the issue until the outermost colonies began to starve. Despite being removed from the worst of the fighting, the periphery worlds suffered even greater numbers of abandonment than their warring counterparts. The fiercely isolationist systems of the Outworlds Alliance were the worst affected. Many of the newest and most distant were reliant on the continual flow of money and resources from the Terran hegemony, a nation-state that no longer existed. Those former hegemony citizens that fled in a mass exodus following the fall of the Star League often ended up out in these backwaters, only to suffer the same miseries they had hoped to flee. As the situation grew desperate, the Outworlds Alliance created a provisional relief force to assist in decolonizing non-viable worlds. The scarcity of food led to a sharp uptick in theft and piracy, necessitating a military presence to maintain law and order. Some Outworlds planets even went as far as hiring small mercenary bands to conduct raids on their supposed allies. Despite their best efforts, many starved long before help arrived. There is a certain sad irony to the fact that the Outworlds Alliance, who were not attacked by Davian or Curita even once during the First Succession War, lost more worlds to famine or abandonment than any of the Great Houses. The barren systems of the Outworlds Wastes live on in interstellar maps as a monument to so many millions of dead. In the wake of the Star League's collapse, banditry was on the rise across all known space. At the forefront of these new pirate kingdoms was the distant Tortuga Dominion, 
and several former Amaris holdings unsurprisingly became pirate enclaves too. The rump states of the former Rimwell's Republic had died out, the Oberon Confederation in 2796 and the Finnmark Free Republic a few years after that, both succumbing to the constant bandit raids and no small amount of meddling by the Lyrans. But the major periphery realms themselves were one of the biggest contributors to the growing epidemic. In the build-up towards the Freedom War, the territorial states had clandestinely funded several rebel or even terrorist groups in an effort to cause maximum unrest within the Star League. When Kerensky granted them their independence, they were left with a number of heavily armed bands who refused to swear fealty to the ruling houses. Instead, they preyed upon the fringe systems while the government was busy trying to rebuild. The remnants of the secret army inadvertently left these rebels with enormous weapon stockpiles that meant they were far beyond the ability of local police to deal with. It was a problem that would continue for years or even decades before peace was finally restored. To help bring an end to the fighting, several new regiments cropped up across the periphery. The Hades Light Infantry and Cassandra's volunteers were reformed, the Pleiades Hussars were expanded, and the Outworlds created the Remora Guards. When the periphery militaries weren't hunting bandits, they were busy preparing for what still felt like an inevitable invasion. Even after 25 years, they were still vastly outnumbered by their old oppressors, and it seemed as if at any moment they could turn outwards and unleash hell upon them. While the successor states had enough raw manpower to weather the devastation, if the same tactics were employed against the periphery, it risked a sudden and terminal collapse. But the Sword of Damocles never fell, and instead the decades-long standoff led to a line of strategic reasoning that we now refer to as the Purana Principle. In nature, individual Puranas will violently and relentlessly attack any prey or potential rival, including other Puranas. However, shoals of Puranas can grow to as many as a thousand fish without them turning on one another in a bloodbath. This is because to attack any of the piranhas around them risks opening themselves to an attack from another, meaning such behavior inevitably leads to their own death. Likewise, the succession wars as a whole exhibit this same behavior. Individually, any single successor state could take on and annihilate one of their smaller periphery neighbors. However, to do so would require redeploying the forces along their other borders to face their new target and doing that would expose themselves to an attack. The stalemate that had developed by this point in the war, and continues on to this day, ensures that no one can ever land a knockout blow. It is because of the Piranha Principle that the smaller periphery states can continue to exist in such close proximity to far larger and more dangerous hostile neighbors. In the roughly 240 years that the succession wars have raged, only one major campaign has ever involved the periphery states. By 2813, control of the Taurian Concordat had passed to protector Semyon Calderon. An imminent Davian invasion had been threatened for some 25 years by this point, but the lack of activity along their border had Calderon and the Taurian Defence Force looking elsewhere for opportunities to strengthen their realm. Lying just beyond their borders were the systems of Detroit and Herotitis, Nominally under the protection of the Magistracy of Canopus, but kept demilitarized by the SLDF, their proximity and sparse garrison made them attractive prizes. In June 2813, the TDF began moving. Strategic command was given to Marshal Blake Andrews, who led the Red Chasseurs towards Detroit, but the first task force to reach their destination were the Pleiades Hazars. Appearing at the zenith of Herotitis, they made little effort to conceal their arrival, allowing a jump ship time to depart and bring word back to the Magistracy. A relaxed burn towards their target gave the planetary militia ample time to launch their aerospace fighters, an asset which the Taurians failed to identify in any significant numbers. Numbers they had though, and the damage they inflicted as the enemy dropships entered atmosphere was extreme. More than two battalions of mechs and over a regiment of conventional forces were wiped out. The Taurian Comptroller paid for his arrogance, as he was one of the first to be shot out of the sky. What few survivors made landfall promptly surrendered. 
When Magistrix Shrawana Centrella got wind of the so-called Heraclitus Crisis, she immediately set about organising a military response. Unaware that the invaders had long since surrendered, she dispatched a pair of her own regiments to seize neutral Spencer on the way towards a strike on the Concordat itself. Meanwhile, Blake Andrews arrived at Detroit. Five regiments under the command of the Torian Guards General Natal Chaudhary touched down in good order and set about chasing down the militia forces. Despite their numbers advantage, unfamiliarity with the terrain meant they struggled to catch their quarry even after several months had transpired. Spencer was to be the first outing for the reformed Cassandra's volunteers. Though the planet was officially neutral, the Star League had declared it within the Concordat's sphere of influence, despite its proximity to the Magistracy. What might at first appear as an administrative error was intentional on the part of the League, as they sought to keep the two territories vying against each other instead of uniting against the High Council. The Torian-leaning militia, far from being caught by surprise, were able to prepare an ambush for the approaching regiment, after identifying their primary objective through signal eavesdropping. They allowed the MAF units to enter the capital unmolested, only springing their trap once they were deep within the urban jungle. At the same time, fighters launched an attack on their dropships, cutting them off from a possible retreat. Cassandra's volunteers surrendered after the first battle, but had already suffered casualties of around 50%. The attack on Portland, the only significant battle to take place within the territory of one of the periphery nations during the First Succession War, was as unsuccessful as all prior engagements during the Magistracy Concordat conflict. The Canopian Light Horse was at least able to swiftly take control of the capital, but after a few failed attempts to halt guerrilla activity, they instead pillaged the city for anything of value and withdrew to their dropships, just in time to receive word that the two realms were already in peace talks. Quickly realising the futility of the conflict, a ceasefire between the two states was ratified in February 2814. The campaign had been a disaster for the Torians, and particularly House Calderon. Both parties blamed Protector Semyon for inciting conflict where before there had been none. He tried to deflect blame by removing Marshal Blake Andrews and appointing Chaudhary as the new head of the TDF but the legacy of defeat would follow him for the next two years, until he was eventually forced to resign. Protector Reina Arantino was chosen by the Privy Council as his successor. The MAF had acquitted itself poorly as well, but their response had at least come quickly, their failures proving less consequential to the Magistracy and House Centrella. Events in the periphery went largely unnoticed by those back in the Inner Sphere. They were far too preoccupied with their own conflict to spare a thought for the distant colonies dropping off the map. The responsibility for logging the gradual abandonment of deep space fell to Comstar, the only sufficiently large entity not currently engaged in destruction. But with so little interest in the periphery, they had little incentive to actively search for evidence of a colony's continued survival. In more than a few cases, Planets that might have been viable withered and died because Comstar had prematurely removed them from the same astro-navigation charts that the few remaining merchant vessels were using to plot a course through the region. Some have even speculated that this was intentional on Blake's part, some petty retribution against those who he believed had brought down the Star League. The question is, how many of those supposedly dead worlds still survive today, hidden from the rest of humanity's view? Alright guys, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this little digression from the main events happening in the Inner Sphere. I know the Periphery doesn't play much of a part in the Succession Wars, but they were still heavily affected by events taking place elsewhere. And I think it's important to take a moment and reflect on that. The Torian Canopian War, pretty much a non-event really, if we're honest. <laughs> it's kind of an embarrassment for both sides, but uh, particularly the Concordat. We've only got two more episodes to go now. The next one's going to be covering a seven year period from 2814 to 2820, going over the final phase of the Davian counter offensive, also going over Operation Spiderweb over on the Marek uh, Steiner border. Because the final chapter is only going to be talking about one year, 2821, it's mainly going to be a summary of the war overall and how it affected the different nations. 
Now that's going to make it quite a short chapter, probably about the same length as this one. And because I don't want that short finale to be a week in waiting, only for a 10-15 minute episode, I'm going to wait until both of the next two chapters are finished before I upload them in a sort of a double bill. Uh, I may do it Saturday, Sunday. I might even have them run concurrently. There's a, a feature on YouTube I want to trial out where you can feed one live stream straight into another. Uh, but I, I have no experience with it, so I'm going to potentially give that a go. No matter how I do it, the two episodes are not going to be any longer than some we've already had earlier in this series. So we're not going to have a, a repeat of any like hour-long episodes like we had back in the Star League Civil War. As ever, if you've enjoyed the video, what I really enjoy is reading your comments about it. Uh, like the video and share it around with other people. That really helps support the channel and helps encourage me complete the series quicker than I might otherwise do. If you want to, I do have a Patreon linked in the description, but that's completely up to yourself. Don't feel you need to support me there. So whether it's next weekend or in two weeks' time, I hope you will join me for the two-part finale of The Succession Wars. End of the road and peace for our time.